Did you sell seven figures worth of income from this or like more like, like mid high six? Uh, yeah, seven figures. Today we are talking with Jerry Liu, currently a creative director at Rive and a man who has seen a lot in his motion design career. He's done plenty of studio work, he did a stint at Meta, he made seven figures selling NFTs and now he's deep in the fast growing world of interactive motion design. In this conversation, Jerry is incredibly transparent about his career, about the NFT roller coaster he got to ride and about his thoughts on the future of the industry. He's a great example of the compounding effects you can see on your career if you work your ass off and if you're a cool person that people like to be around. So now let's meet Jerry. Jerry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. I cannot wait to uh, pick your brain about NFTs and rive and about uh, being late all the time. So I'm, <laughs> I'm really, uh, <laughs> which is ironic because you actually were a little bit late to our <laughs> to our interview. Yeah. But dude, anyway, th- I'm really excited to talk with you. So thanks for doing this. Likewise. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. This, is, this is fun. Right on, man. So it's funny. So, you know, we have everyone fill out this like pre-interview questionnaire and, uh, and I asked you like, what was, you know, your biggest mistake in your career? Cause a lot of times, like you get a good story out of that. And you said, you know, I used to be known for kind of being like the guy that's always late. Um, and you, and now you regret that, you know? So I was wondering, just yeah. maybe we start there. Like, um, cause you've been in this industry for a while. You've done a lot of different things. And I thought that was an interesting lesson. Maybe you could just talk about sort of like the importance of, you know, little things like that throughout your career. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just to, to caveat, this was like way back in the day before I was married yeah. and had kids. Yeah, um, it's all fixed now. Now that never happens. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I was young at the time. I, I, I think I was like just a night owl. I still am a night owl. I would stay up late, you know, playing video games and, and, and just, I would work on my personal art and stuff. Um, so I ended up coming into work late pretty much all the time. But I, I always got my work done. I never missed a deadline. I was often like one of the few folks that would stay like super late um, to get stuff done. You know, at the time I, I thought it was justified and most of the folks I worked with were, were fine with it. But, you know, as a dad and like a, a grown ass man now, right. I, I, I realize um, it's not really all about that. It's, it's, it was a bit disrespectful to the, not only my managers, but also my teammates that I worked with. So that is one thing I, I do regret. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting cause you can get away with stuff like that if you're really talented, which you are. And if you, especially if you're winning pitches for, for your boss or for your clients, but I'm curious cause you just said that, um, you know, you, you were always kind of the guy that would stay late, right. And work all night and get stuff done. And maybe that's cause you're a night owl, but also, you know, I remember like when I was in my twenties and I was freelancing and I actually didn't mind staying really late, you know, and, and burning the midnight oil sometimes. And I mean, you know, very rarely I would do all nighters. It did happen a couple times. And there's, there's a lot of different opinions about that, you know, and, and some people are like, you should never do that ever. Like it's unhealthy and it's, and you're being taken advantage of. And then I don't know, I'm kind of a pragmatist. I feel like, yeah, you don't want to do that, but like sometimes you have to, or, or the thing doesn't get done. And you're generally not the one who's going to be screwed by that. It's going to be your client or it's going to be your boss, right? So how, how do you think about that now, you know, being a dad and having more responsibilities? So I'm, I'm pretty guilty of working late, even though I tell myself I shouldn't. Just So a lot, a lot of this stuff is kind of like self-imposed. I think in general, it's not healthy to expect to work late all the time. Right. Um, but obviously there's... There's caveats to that. Like, you know, if it's crunch time and and you're working with a team, I think there's a lot of gray area. Like these days, like, as I mentioned earlier, like working with Rive, we're we're leading up to a big gaming conference. So I've been burning the midnight oil a lot these days. Well, let me ask you this. So like, so you're burning the midnight oil, but like, are you, uh, are you burning the midnight oil in terms of like, you're working 14 hours a day? Or is it more like you're shifting your hours and you're just doing more at night because I think you know these days that's a lot more doable too like for example I I work I think my best work this is kind of sick but like my best work is done at like four in the morning like if I'm if we're in crunch mode on something here I get up at four in the morning and make a big pot of coffee and then I I've basically like three hours of completely uninterrupted silence and that's where I do my best work but then I'm not also gonna work until like seven or eight o'clock that night you know yeah I think 
Yeah, to that point, I, I generally work. I guess I get, I'm the most productive after my kids go to sleep because it's like dead quiet. Absolutely. But yeah, going back to what you said earlier, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of factors. Like, like when I was like 20 or 30, I didn't mind working those kind of hours, but now I'm, I'm, I'm like early 40s. So Same. even if I wanted to, like, it's just not, it, it doesn't make sense to do that. Yeah. To push that hard. You almost get a hangover from, like I do for sure. Like if I stay up late, even drinking zero alcohol, like I will yeah. be hung over <laughs> the next day yeah, yeah. if I, you know, if I'm up past probably like 12, that's kind of my limit. So yeah, that's really funny. That's, that's another thing. I noticed that like if, if you push too hard, like, like you said, after 12, I think the quality of work during those hours is hindered compared to like the quality of work you probably produce. Yeah. You know, at like seven in the morning or eight in the morning. Yeah. hundred percent. So let's, let's take a, a step back now. So, you know, you've, I, I went through your LinkedIn, I Google stocks you, I looked at all your work and stuff and you, it, it looks like you sort of started, um, in, in a semi-traditional way in the motion design industry. And now you're doing all kinds of stuff, right? So why don't we go back in time? Tell me like, how did you get into doing animation and design, doing this kind of work? So growing up, I, I always like drew a lot, like a lot of kids. Uh, I watched cartoons and, and collected comics and stuff like that. So I've always known that I've always wanted to do something art related. And I think throughout high school, I've always taken like AP art classes and stuff like that. And then in college, I kind of spent my first three years just kind of sticking around. I think like a lot of, a lot of kids kind of like needed that time to mature a little bit. And then I think around my third year, I decided to get my act together and go to SVA. Mm -hmm. And where were you? Where did you grow up? Were you in New York or were you somewhere else? I grew up in Maryland. Okay. I'm in Maryland now. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So you were already on the East Coast and then you decided to go to SVA. It makes sense. Yeah. So like when I went to SVA, I, I, I went for the interview. My GPA was like horrible. The interviewer was like, you know, you, you can't do this here. And then I think he saw that my portfolio was actually decent. So he was like, I'll give you a chance. I really wanted to major in like animation or uh, I think they had like, I think computer, computer anime or computer graphics for, for like films and stuff. But I think the only major they would allow me to enter in was graphic design, which in retrospect, I'm super happy I went that route because I feel like everything needs that, that baseline of good design. Absolutely. So luckily they let me in and then, you know, I busted my ass off. I, I think I made, I made Dean's List. And from there, I I believe it was like my s end of my second year, a buddy of mine was doing motion graphics and I had no idea what, what that was. Um, I always thought like animation was like, you know, for like people training to, to work at Pixar and Disney and stuff. So then my third and fourth year, I took nothing but just motion graphics courses. This was like 2002 or 2003. All right. Yeah. Um, so this is like before like motion graphics was like a thing. Um, it's the dawn of it, really. You know, early yeah. MK12 and PSYOP and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. MK12. I think we talked about it, like too advanced, all that stuff. Like, yeah, that for stuff sure, yeah. like was like my jam. Um, so I was like super excited to do that. And then my fourth year, I only took one portfolio class because I had all these credits transfer from, from you know, screwing up at university before. Um, so I actually started freelancing and I, I would tell uh, folks that I, w I was pretty much done with school already. That's kind of my way of saying, like, I, I deserve, like, the, whatever you're paying, like, folks at a school, like, give me a chance. And then they actually did. And then, uh, and then when it came time for, like, my, my uh, I think it was, like, end-of-the-year portfolio, like, we have this big screening at the Art Artist Club where we show everybody our work. Um, I would invite them, and they, were, they would be like, wait, <laughs> like, I thought you were at, done with school already. Um, so that was cool. Like, I think that was kind of the catalyst of me just like diving in straight into the motion design world. Got it. And so from there, you ended up working, you know, at that point, you're in New York, sort of, you know, one of the two at that time, for sure, like centers of motion design. So what, like, which studios were, were you working with? And did you find it, you know, was it easy to get work? Was it hard? At the time, it was pretty, pretty easy. Not easy, but it was, I mean, you know, like disclose that I, I was like busting my ass off. I was waking up, you know, going to school and then coming home and just doing like motion, motion work, like all night until I went to sleep. Yeah. But yeah, at the time it was a lot easier than it is now to get work. I don't know if you remember 
a place called Version 2 or Liquid Light No. back in the day. So I did a lot of work with them. I did a lot of work with, I'm trying to remember. I mean, you would have had in those days Deeks, Startups, Deeks Brand New School would have been super busy. Yeah, Brand New School, uh, Freestyle Collective. Yep. Um, like right out of school, I, I worked with those folks, um, awesome. which was awesome. I'm a big fan of like Gerald and Victor and all them. That's so cool. So, okay, so let me take you one step back. So like you're, you clearly have that thing and it's, it's really cool. I, I try to beat this into my kids in like a sweet, you know, loving way. Work ethic, right? You, you clearly like don't, you're not afraid to work your ass off, right? And just kind of do whatever it takes. And I'm always, I've asked a lot of artists this question, so I'll ask it to you because I, I, I'm, even to this day, I'm not really quite sure what I believe and where I stand on this, but like your work is awesome and it's like you're really really talented and so is it so i'm always wondering like okay is it because jerry has that work ethic and he's worked so many hours that's why he's good or you also went to sva right so you you got an education in design is that why you're good like so i'm curious if you have any thoughts kind of in hindsight as to why you were successful seemingly it sounds like it was basically right off the bat you were getting work and sort of you know you didn't you didn't have to you know, slave away for years to get your foot in the door. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of all of that. And also timing, I think. So during that time, motion graphics was pretty pretty fresh. Right. The skill set was kind of in demand at the time. So I think that definitely helped. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I did work extremely hard. I'm also very passionate about just doing this stuff. Like, like I, I like like silly little things like game UI and like just getting lost in the details and how buttons move and, and things like that. Um, so it was kind of a niche thing that I was just happened to be passionate about. And I, I think that definitely helped as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a combo of like working hard and actually having a passion for what I'm doing. And I guess growing up, I just kind of had an artistic sensibility about myself all the time. So I, I, I mean, I don't want to call it like natural skill, but it's I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the right word. Yeah. It's hard not it's hard not to talk about it sometimes without sounding pretentious, right? Because it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. you know it's like, it, it, yeah, it's like you, you're you didn't choose to be born loving animation, right? It, it's one yeah, of those yeah. things it's like you there's not like a conscious choice that oh, I'm really into this. You just are. But then because of that you probably can hyper focus on it for hours and hours and hours whereas someone else who couldn't care less, they're into cars or something, they wouldn't work as hard if they were a motion designer. Yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, you know, it's it's not for everybody. There's yeah. there's a lot of work involved unless unless you really enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. What about um in the pre-interview you mentioned that I don't remember exactly how you put it, but you basically said you're not so sure that school, you know, going to private art school if you want to get into motion design, you're not so sure that that's really the best move anymore. And you did go to SVA in New York City. I'm assuming, you know, I I don't know your financial situation, but I'm assuming it was expensive one way or another. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that, you know, like how much credit do you give your formal education? Do you think that it's different now than it was when you went? Yeah, I mean, so I have friends with kids that are getting ready to try to go to art school and I've been kind of out of the loop, but when they tell me how much tuition is now, I'm just like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, like, it's unbelievable. Because I thought it was expensive when I went. And honestly, like my experience at SVA was amazing. Um, you know, I met, a, I made a lot of lifelong friendships and connections there. But I think, like with anything, it's a lot about, it's a little bit less about the facility itself and more about the community that you that you uh, kind of explore with or, or learn with. I think looking back, I would probably not spend that type of money with all the um, resources we have now. And there's just a lot, of, a lot of more affordable, accessible alternatives to art school. So I, I don't know if I would do it again. And I, I actually, when my friends tell me like how much it costs, I'm like, no, I like try something else first. And if they need the structure, yeah. And if you have that type of money to throw around, then yeah, it's cool. It's definitely a cool experience, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's 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 not cheap. That's a, basically exactly the advice I give people because I get asked that all the time. And it's like you know, and and the the one I'm familiar with is Ringling, where I taught and room and board and tuition now for one year of Ringling, I'm pretty sure is over eighty thousand dollars a year. You add that up, you multiply that times four, you add in the interest you're going to be paying because, of course, you're going to take out loans. I mean, you could very easily spend half a million dollars <laughs> like to go to go learn how to do motion design. 
it's really hard for me to suggest doing that for people that are going to have to take out lots and lots of debt. And I know there's there's a lot of um, people who are going to hear this and listen to this that don't live in the states where that's fairly typical for a private, you know, high end college like that 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 price tag actually isn't that weird. And what, what's crazy is that's about that's almost four times what my college cost. And I went to Boston University, which is another expensive college, but you know, it's 20 years ago. It's interesting to hear you say that. And then, you know, so, okay, so maybe just let's spitball here. Um, I can, I could recommend an online school that I think is really good at teaching people motion design. But the thing, um, the, the thing you mentioned was that it's, it's not really about like the facilities and maybe even like the classes themselves. It's like you, you're surrounded by these amazing artists and you get this network and, you know, you've got your instructors are now part of your network and then your, your fellow students, all that stuff. But if you're doing it online, it's much harder to get all of that. So have you found any other ways, you know, like, uh, you know, you've got, you've got two young daughters and when they're older, if they want to follow in dad's footsteps, how, how do you think you could get them that experience and that network without having to spend half a million dollars? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Well, so my firstborn Riley, she actually takes art class, mm -hmm. um, you know, in person. I, I really wish I had this when I was younger, but we were lucky to find this teacher who actually specializes in prepping kids' portfolios to apply to art school or whatever. Like, like when I was growing up, a lot of these teachers didn't know what they were doing. I remember I took this one class, and then at the end of the class, the teacher told my mom, she, he was like, I don't really have anything to teach this kid. He should be teaching the class. Right. I was like, all right. I was like, it sucks for me because, like, you know, where am I going to, like, grow it's tough. I think as they get older, like my kids are pretty young, but once they start getting into like social media and like Discord and Slack and stuff, um, there's a lot of pretty cool communities. And, you know, obviously school emotions communities. Like when I took EJ's class, that's one thing I actually really enjoyed was like being able to take this class with other folks mm -hmm. and like share your work and stuff like that. I even think that compared to my time at SVA, which was like, I don't know, like 20 years ago, the sense of community is a lot stronger these days. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's like just the time we're in or because it's post pandemic or what, but you know, yeah. with Zoom and Slack and Discord and all those, all those tools. Well, you know, I, I recently interviewed um, Austin Bowens. He runs a studio called Ravi and he's 21. And so it was interesting talking to him. You know, he's uh, like, I'm 42, so I'm twice his age. And you said you're, you're early 40s, so we're probably pretty close, right? And, um, you know, I think the younger generation, it's so, it's pretty natural for me, actually, and, and maybe for you, like, to bond with someone you've never met in person and just, you know, over, over a call like this or over a Slack mm -hmm. channel. Um, you know, there's people that work full-time at School of Motion I've never met in person. And um, so I think that's getting more normal. But for the younger generation, I think that's totally normal. Like, I think for my kids, you know, I have a 13, 11, and an 8. I think that they will have, you know, potentially best friends that they met online and didn't meet in person for years. I think that's just sort of normal. So it maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's the solution. It's like it just it becomes more digital. And especially as we get things like VR headsets where you can now, I don't know if you saw the interview with uh, Mark Zuckerberg that's, and Lex Friedman yeah. where it was like these two, yeah. they look so real. Stuff like that, maybe maybe that's how you get the community without the having to literally go move to Manhattan and go to this really expensive school. Yeah, I mean, even without, I mean, I might be old fashioned. Like, I, I could do without the the whole metaverse. Like, like I, I think just in Slack and Discord is fine. Like, you know who Dan Savage is? Yep. He, yeah. So we're like, he's like a super close friend of mine, and I think we've seen each other in person like twice, but we <laughs> talk awesome. like yeah almost every day for a while. Um, yeah, I think I saw him once, like maybe 10 years ago, and then I saw him again in person yeah. uh, over the summer. But we're, we're like, he's probably one of my closest friends in the industry. And, you know, we're, we're not that young. So I think the tools are, are pretty decent that we have now. The technology is a little bit scary. <laughs> so maybe I'm just like being an old man, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay too. So let me ask you, uh, I, I want to dig into some of this, this newer technology that uh, you know, us uh, MoGraphers of a certain age uh, ha have had to grapple with. But I first wanted to ask you one more thing about how you learned this stuff. So you, know, you, you went to SVA. It sounds like growing up, you were you know, one of those kids that draws all the time and, and really just loved art. But looking at a lot of the work that, especially uh, the NFT stuff, there's a lot of character animation 
that you do. And to me, character animation was always like this uh, sub sub skill of animation, right? Like, you know, I, I can animate a logo just fine. I can make little balls fly around and do all kinds of stuff. But you give me a character to animate, I'm just not that good at it, right? And I haven't practiced it. Frankly, don't want to be good at it. <laughs> if I'm being honest, it's kind of a pain in the ass. But I'm curious where you got that skill from because, uh, you know, until I actually had someone teach me the sort of the, the right way to do it, I couldn't do it at all. Like everything looked bad. And then finally, I, I met someone who was good at it who showed me, no, you need to do like hold keyframes and like do pose to pose and do it this way. And now I can kind of I can kind of fake it. But your work has a ton of really complex movement in it. I'm curious, like, where did you learn that? I actually never really studied character animation. I'm just a, like a huge fan of it. And then timing and pacing are like two things that I pay like super extra attention to. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that kind of translates to character animation. Just like getting a knack for how things move naturally, uh, secondary motion, stuff like that. Yeah. So I think over time, I just, I'm just a huge fan of it, and I've, I've done it a lot. So I, I kind of just, I think through practice and, and just genuinely liking it, I, 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 got, I got pretty decent at it. But yeah, I agree with you. Like, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. When it comes to, like, client work, if you have to make a tweak on a character animation, it's 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 a huge pain in the ass. So I, I kind of save it for more personal work. Yeah. I think that's really cool, though, for, you know, and anyone listening or watching this, character animation is one of those things that still feels like, okay, it is helpful to have some formal education in it. Because there, there, there is a way to do it that, you know, sort of is standardized, and it's not the only way to do it. But also it's cool to know that if you just brute force it and just practice it enough and, and if you're good, I assume you probably have a good eye for like noticing little details too. So that helps. You can actually get good at it without that, you know? Um, yeah. It's kind of like a theme here. <laughs> it's almost like, you know how people say taste is important and yeah. it's kind of hard to, hard to learn. I think also a sense of timing and pacing is also one of those things where like, I mean, this is just like a broad generalization, but like either you get it or you don't. Um, it's a little bit hard to acquire that kind of like sensibility or like, does, it, does that make sense at all? It does. I mean, it, you're, you're reminding me this is kind of off topic, but I mean, I remember when I was, so I, I played drums, like a drum set behind me. When I was, yeah. when I was learning drums, like rhythm, you know, just like being mm -hmm. able to count, like that came very natural to me. My best friend at the time bought a guitar and it's like he didn't have that part of his brain. Like he literally could not play to a metronome. It just had there was it just never was going to happen, no matter. And and so it was kind of weird because I thought, is there, like like it, it, does he not get? Does he not hear it? So I think that some people just have certain like abilities, and then that leads them into like, oh well, now I'm interested in this because I'm also good at it. And you know may, maybe there's some of that. Yeah, I, I, I love these philosophical questions about like no, why are people good at stuff? You know. No, like when you said that, that kind of reminds me of like, it's either you can dance or you can't. Like, like some <laughs> some people can dance right. and they're just like natural. Not me. And some people, you know, <laughs> some people can't. You know, you know what I mean. Can you dance, Jerry? <laughs> I used to. I used to dance. I mean, I can't anymore. I'm just. It gets me too tired. I'm yeah. getting old. Um, but I, I dance with my daughters all the time. Oh, that's awesome. Um, that's yeah. so cool, man. Right on. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask you, before we start talking about Rive and the interactive stuff that you've been doing, which I'm super fascinated by, I wanted to ask you about the NFT thing because you you were kind of deep. I don't, know, I don't know if you're still doing it or if that's kind of on the back burner now, but when I was looking at your work, you, you made a lot of NFTs and you know it looks like you had a lot of success with it. So maybe you could just tell the story of like, you know, okay, you've never heard of an NFT and then all of a sudden you beeple makes millions of dollars. What happens next? How did you fall into this? Yeah, that's a, that was an interesting time. Um, I am still doing it, um, but just, you know, obviously I've shifted my main focus to, to arrive and helping mm -hmm. build like what they're doing. But yeah, I think 2000 or 2021. I think it was tw 20 is when 2020, I think, was when Beeple sold his thing at Christie's. And that, that sort of yeah. exploded the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, it's, it was straight up. It was bananas. Yeah. I got into it a little bit before that. I think I think I saw a signal noise. Uh, you know signal noises? Yeah. Or James, his mm -hmm. goes by James, or his real name is James White and Genuine Human. His real name is Jay. Those are two artists I'm a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. um, I saw them posting like NFT stuff, and it kind of piqued my interest. I, I hit them up. And asked them for some advice, but they were also like really new to it. So they try to 
give me what info they had. But I, I, I like to think of myself like always open-minded and try new things. So I, I thought it was cool. And to me, when I did a little bit of research about the tech behind it, it kind of sounded like like Pokemon cards or like a lot of people like to compare it to Beanie Babies. Mm -hmm. But I, I always compare it to like Pokemon cards or like cool art prints that you would buy at Comic-Con or something. Yeah. Or like, like Mondo, or if you feel like Mondo, mm -hmm. they sell like those, those posters. So yeah, I, I, I'm always, I, I've always been into that stuff. So I thought it was cool. And then, you know, it kind of enabled folks like us to do that type of work, but in the format of animation because of like Providence and the, the, the certificate of ownership behind blockchain technology. So I, I just dive right in. I, I think, I think I minted like one of my, it was like the real intro to one of my latest reels. And then somebody bought it in like 24 hours. And I was like, okay, I was like, this is kind of fun. So I, I kind of just, you know, just went, I'll probably keep this safe for work. Uh, I was going to say <laughs> blank, blank deep. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know yeah, what you, yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you're saying. There. Yeah. I, w I went pretty deep, like right away, yeah. like off the bat. Yeah. And then, you know, luckily I found some, some decent success and then, you know, I was able to foster a nice community around it. So you were looking at this, you were looking at it like, okay, this, these are digital collectibles. I can totally like relate, you know, okay, I, I love collecting this type of thing. Now I can, you know, I can create digital collectibles of my animations. That's really appealing. And you've got this really cool collection. I think, I don't know if I'll say it right, but Kibatsu Mecha. And Kibatsu, yeah, yeah. yes, he's really cool. You know, we're, we're going to link to all this stuff in the show notes and, and, and people can go check it out. It's really cool. And I think, I'm assuming you did some sort of algorithmic thing where you generated, you know, thousands of variations of these things and, and sold them. But I guess my question is, so I, I feel very differently now about the NFT thing than I did at the time when it was, when, when the hype was happening. By the way, I just looked it up. So Beeple's thing was in uh, 2021, like uh, I think, you know, March or something like that. And that started this gold rush. I saw a lot of artists have uh, like initial success selling NFTs. And you know, even back then, I, I felt something was weird about all of this and I didn't quite get it. And now I feel pretty strongly like, okay, that was clearly a bubble. I'm not sure there ever was any real value to it, but there's still lots of people making NFTs and stuff. So uh, like, how do you feel like, you know, and, and for the record, anyone who made a lot of money selling NFTs, I think that's amazing and good for you. And, and I wish more artists could have and, and, and still could. But I'm, I'm just still very skeptical, <laughs> to, to be honest about the whole thing. So I'm curious, like, how did you feel at the time? Did you feel like, oh, this makes perfect sense. Of course, people are going to want these digital collectibles. <laughs> and did you think this would last forever? And, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that side of it. Sure. All right. Give it to me. Give it to me, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. The space is like so like canceling. So I'm going to I'm trying to be sensitive to what I say. Okay. But I also be throw me under the bus. As as <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm talking about like just in general. So at the time, I I thought it was awesome. Like like I said, like I'm into collectibles. Like I don't know if you could see, but like I collect a ton of books and toys and, yeah. and just like I'm into that stuff. Like if there's like a like an Ali Moss Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, you know, art print of a hundred, you know, I I would buy one. I I would spend solid money to, to get yeah. one that's banned um, posters because I, for me yeah yeah because yeah. i want it and i want to like display it yeah but not because i want to flip it exactly um, yeah so to me it just reminded me of that like when you when you try to buy a mondo print and then these bots just like bought it and then flip it on ebay for double or triple the price right away that's what it was like for a while but i mean it was it was a fun time for like artists to just explore and experiment with their personal work mm -hmm. and just shooting their shot at making some coin or just even a living off of it. Like, yeah. uh, I know I'm, I'm sure you've heard of like DK. Yep. Like he blew up Crushed people, it, obviously yeah. like, like that's like the dream for like a lot of artists like us. So I thought it was cool. I like, and like you said, th it was a gold rush. Like a lot of people did it. Some folks did it, made a bit of money and just disappeared. Some folks stuck around. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of like, like an artist alley. Like when you, when you're an artist in an artist alley at Comic-Con, you make your rounds. Like after you sell your work, you go around and find all all your all the people that you're a fan of. You buy their work, they buy your work. It's like it's a fun. It's like an art swap. And I felt like that was the vibe for a while until people started throwing around like thousands of dollars for like pictures of like monkeys or cats or whatever. Like 
And I was like, all right. And then I think when that happens, you attract a different type of crowd or, or customer or consumer. Yeah. That is not necessarily conducive to creativity or, or the reason I like to think a lot of artists, you know, you know, dip their toes in it. So I think that took us to where like, you know, a lot of skepticism, a lot of scammers, a lot of cash grabbing, things like that. Yeah. It, yeah. It most obviously was a bubble, but I think it was more like a correction versus a bubble. Like nobody's going to, it's not sustainable to pay like 40 G's for, for a picture of a monkey. But like, if you really like that monkey, you know, maybe you'll pay like a couple hundred bucks for it. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, uh, I think it was just like kind of an inevitable for this correction to happen. Yeah. And then now I think it's almost healthier that I'm pretty sure a lot of listeners know, like the space has been kind of dead for the past, I don't know, year and a half, but a lot of like really talented artists and innovators have stuck around and kept building. And I think, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and I think the price just got corrected for most things. And now it's like, it's good because I think the mainstream can afford to like dabble a little bit where before they couldn't afford to buy those, those monkeys or cats for 40, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I get, okay. That makes sense. And I guess I'm looking at it, you know, like my, uh, the, the, the connection I always make is like my son is a good example, right? He plays, so he's, he's got a meta quest and he plays this game called Gorilla Tag <laughs> where you're a gorilla and you have to use your arms to run. It's pretty funny to watch him do it. And they sell, uh, you know, like hats and things you, that your gorilla can wear, right? It's, it's basically flair. It doesn't affect the game at all. And to him, I can see it, it, those things are meaningful to him. Whereas to me, like a digital one of one of something, I don't know, maybe it's just me because I know a lot of people like it actually does feel valuable to them. Like, no, I own the rights to that monkey jpeg that's actually <laughs> I, I get some i get some internal value from that i never did and maybe that's why it was so hard for me to understand like yeah no i i totally understand the digital collectible thing i understand and i can even understand it like hey yeah like if i have some website where i can like have a gallery and there's a lot of people going to this and then there's like a little bit of a community around that yeah i'll pay you know 10 20 bucks for some cool thing if i'm really into it so maybe it was just the dollar amounts. That once they started to yeah. get crazy and I started to see things like, I remember talking to an artist at NAB probably two years ago who was doing a lot of NFTs and, was, and seemed to be doing well. And I asked him about it. I won't use, I won't use his name for the same reason because you, know, <laughs> you don't want to blow people up. But he was telling me how he approached it. And basically, it was very data-driven. It was, and it was almost like a you know, like a day trader, <laughs> like going each day to OpenSea and to Foundation and go here and see what's selling and what kind of niches are doing well that day, that week, do that kind of artwork, promote it a certain way, use these words, because those were, you know, vibes, you know, wag me, whatever. And that's, and, and so it was literally like being a trader, <laughs> you know, like a, like a yeah. day trader. It wasn't about the art, <laughs> you know, and, and, and cool. Good for him. He made money, but like, um, it was just the business model didn't make sense to me. It didn't seem sustainable. And it turns out it wasn't sustainable at least to replace freelance income for most people. Right. Did you think at some point yeah. this might be just your full-time career now? I'm just going to make NFTs. I did actually. Uh, and I, I did actually make it my full-time career for a while. I was at Meta when I started like dabbling and then. I was about to join just full time, but then I found a good amount of success in a Web3 space where I thought I could just do it full time. This kind of opportunity doesn't really come very often. So I was like, can I, I'm going to per pursue this. And they're totally cool about it. Um, they're like, yeah, 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 go, go do it. And then I did that for like probably the past year and a half up until I joined Rive. I think. I don't know if, I mean, there's a few factors, but I, I think like most people, I just, it just didn't turn out to be as sustainable as I thought it was right. sort of a bubble and that type of money wasn't going to be thrown around, um, forever. But I do think for a handful of folks, it is sustainable. Like the top just, artists, like the, the really well-known ones, not just artists, but like, like teams and companies, 
Um, they're actually building legit. Like, there's this game that I'm a huge fan of called Parallel. It's like a like a like Magic the Gathering, but like yeah, with like it's like cyberpunk and and like uh, like futuristic. And actually, a, a good buddy of mine is one of the founders, Oscar Marr. Do you mm-hmm. know his work? No. He's he's big into like fooey and gooey and all that stuff. Oh, cool. Um, and they're doing amazing. And it's actually like a super fun game. So like, I think there's a handful of folks doing that. And this is all public information. You can go on Crunchbase. I think they got funded like $50 million or something. So they're like, they hired like uh, Chris, Chris Pierre, Bajer? I'm not, I'm probably butchering his last name. Like Nepatali, a bunch of like, like folks that kind of do like uh, work kind of in the same vein as like Ash Thorpe and Machake. Yeah, like heavy hitters kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're just like living out their dream. They're just doing whatever they want. It's like the coolest stuff. Yeah. Um, so that I think is like really awesome. But that's like rare. That's like the cream of the crop. And I wonder, man, like, like I'm looking at their website now. It looks beautiful. looks really cool. And you're, and you know, you're telling me, okay, they raised $50 million. Great. If they're smart, that's enough runway to last a really long time. Even without ever having a chance of making a profit somehow. So like I, I did a, um, the one NFT thing that I did really kind of dabble in was this game, it was called Steppin. So I'm a runner and uh, me and my co-founder of Rolo, Joe Donaldson, he, he's a runner too. And we both did this, we, we, uh, we played this game and basically it's like an app, uh, Step, it's S-T-E-P-N. And the game was you, it's like a running app. So you turn it on, it's got GPS and you go for a run. But the game is you buy shoes and there's different shoes with different attributes and and so and, and the shoes an NFT. So you have to buy it. And I think when I bought in, it was like a thousand dollars for one of these shoes. And uh, yeah, I remember trying to explain to my wife what the hell this thing was. I'm gonna spend a thousand dollars on this uh, NFT shoe. And you buy it, and then when you run, you earn. They had their own cryptocurrency, uh, like this in-game thing. And then you, but they, but you could transfer it out and turn it into dollars if you wanted to, right? Or you mm-hmm. could keep it in the game and use it to upgrade the shoe. And it was cool. It was like this game. And it, and as a runner, I was like, this is so cool. And like, I'd go for a run. I'd be like, I just made $100. This is insane. But then like, I started having this voice in my head saying like, where is this money com- coming from? Like, where is the value that's creating this money that I'm taking coming from? And they had a Discord, like every NFT project. And people would ask that question and immediately get kicked out. And... I, and then I'd get on Reddit and people would basically say like, look, like, you know, I'm a mathematician. There's absolutely no way that this is ever going to work. Like this will work as long as there is a greater fool to buy the shoe after you bought yours. Right. So I don't know. I don't know anything about this parallel thing, but, um, I, I, I feel like there's a lot of that. (laughs) Yeah. No, you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, I'm willing to get canceled for this, Jerry. I'll say it so you don't no, have to. I'll, 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 I'm down. I'm yeah. down. Let's do it. No, like I said, I'm, I'm usually careful of what I say, but I'm I, I'm actually pretty known in that space for just being honest. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just speak candidly and honestly. It most definitely is like greater th- greater full theory behind like 95 percent of this stuff. I think it all comes down to like, like I said, I will pay money for like a John Carpenter sign, Big Trouble in Little China poster. Oh, uh, great you know movie, I mean? dude. Like, Holy cow. You're <laughs> like, like, you're not going to buy like that to flip more. it. But I think whenever there's money being thrown around, the flippers, they, they smell it and they yeah. come in and they, you know, eBay or whatever, OpenSea. And, and VCs just, and VCs. Like someone yeah, gave Parallel yeah, $50 million just, thinking, yeah, of course, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So I think it comes down to like creating an experience or like art or a consumable that people actually enjoy enough to yeah. to buy. Um, and I think that's what it comes down to. And like nobody enjoys a monkey picture enough to spend a hundred thousand dollars on it. Right. The the person that's spending a hundred thousand dollars on their monkey picture, I mean, I'm pretty sure is counting on flipping it at some point, unless they just got money like that to spend. Because I think Justin Bieber bought one. And he, he said he just liked it because it, it felt like it was, it, it represented him. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I remember seeing, you know, Paris Hilton on the uh, Jimmy Fallon show and they're showing their monkey JPEGs. And it's like, I, well, I think, you know, even at the time, I think it was clear that like anything else, right? Like if you're buying something that expensive, that is, I mean, I, I don't know, it's not useless. I mean, you can use that to go to, you know, parties and stuff. And there was some utility to it. But in the end, you're buying the story you get to tell other people. 
I bought this. This, you know, this yeah. represents me. I'm part of this club now. Um, and actually, I'm all for that. You know, like I, there, there is a certain aspect of the, you know, I, it, I think this, this word gets thrown around way too easily in these circles of like it's a community. It's a community. I think there is something to that. I just think that everything got so out of whack. You know, I saw artists burn bridges and do things that I'm sure they regret <laughs> to this day because they thought, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire and I'm never going to have to do client work again. If So I, I, whatever you're comfortable sharing, uh, you don't have to give exact numbers if you don't want to. But I'm curious, like at the height of it, how much were you making with NFTs and how much, you know, you said you're still kind of doing it, but you obviously have a full time job. Like how much is that dropped these days? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all this stuff is on the blockchain, so anybody can look it up if mm -hmm. they wanted to. I don't want to be too candid about it, but sure, I yeah. mean, I, 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 I did enough where like, uh, I wanted to leave a place like Meta to pursue it. Like Meta, any, any of those f Fang or, yeah. or. Like, did you, did you, did you sell seven figures worth of, or like, did you actually get seven figures worth of income from this or like more like, like mid high six? Yeah, seven figures. Okay. But it was like, a one-time thing. Sure, like yeah. I, I put out that kabatsu thing and I was really careful because I knew a lot of money was being thrown around. So I was like, I don't want to be on the hook right. for any promises. I was like, this is just art. Oh, actually going back, I just want to, I just want to clarify, like, you know, I, you mentioned something about generating this using like a, a, a script or anything. Yep. I actually did all of them by hand. I did every single one. Isn't there like, like 2,000 or something? <laughs> yeah, there's like 2,222. I didn't use any script. Dude, I you just are a workhorse, man. Piece That's it, amazing. Pieced it together, uh, you know, you know, like pre-comps and, you know, right. you have to rename everything. It was such a pain in the ass. I literally spent like a month and a half just putting things together after the artwork was done. And I thought that would be like something people would see as value. You know, I quickly find out like after I sold out, maybe like ten percent really wanted to keep it, and ninety percent wanted to flip it. Yeah. And uh, with anything like this, like you know, the value kind of went up, and then it went down, and people weren't able to flip it for as much as they thought they would. You right. know, people bought it for speculation, and the pitchforks came out, and that's when I was like, okay, I see what the space is about. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, right? It's like, um, it sounds like you were very smart about it because. You know, for a, for a, a motion designer to make a million dollars in a year is extremely rare, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, does not happen barely ever. And I, and it would be very tempting to say like, oh my god, I did it once, I can do it again, and this is just what I'm gonna do. And and also to have the discipline to say like, yeah, a million bucks, ton of money, but you got two kids, you know, you got this long life taxes, ahead of dude. you. Um, taxes, it, yeah, taxes, right? Dude, like, taxes ruined everything oh dude yeah shoot and I'm, I'm assuming like i don't know was that was that capital gains tax i don't even know what the tax situation is no, on it's it's just straight income like my my oh yeah it's it's income yeah. and my 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 accountant was just like yelling at me he was like what is he's like i'm happy for you but what is this what mess? Yeah. Like, and he was trying to say it was like cap gains tax i was like no this is income because i sold it like it was almost like i think it was so new at the time like a lot of accountants didn't know what to do but I was like, no, no, no. I was like, I'm not trying to like go to jail. Like, I wanted to pay what I owe, and it turned out I owed a lot. Um, yeah, I bet. Which, <laughs> you know, it sucks, but I, you're rather... in the highest tax bracket if you make a million dollars in a year. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. When well, I wonder, like, um, you know, if you if you buy an NFT and then it the price goes up and then you sell it, then I I'm, assume it would be capital gains. But since you made it, yeah, yeah, you know, like whatever the you. profit, yeah. Because yeah. I was also like kind of. Like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I play poker and I go to casinos all the time. So yeah. I'm kind of like a gambler. I have gambling in my blood. Yeah. So I was also buying some like, not monkey JPEGs, but maybe like, maybe like bears and cats and whatever. Yeah. The, the lower tier animals. <laughs> yeah. I got uh, to, to, to mess around <laughs> with. And like, yeah, my account was like, what, what, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, just, just, just screwing around. Oh, um, that's so funny. Okay, and so now, uh, obviously, you're not making seven figures a year with no. the NFTs, but like, you know, I, I saw that the, um, the the Kabatsu Mecca stuff, you are getting a royalty on secondary sales and all that. What does that actually turn into these days for you? It's like zero. So at the time, it was a big kind of like lump sum, the first initial sale of everything. Yep. And then, you know, naturally, during the hype, people were trading. So I did get a decent amount of royalties off of that. But then after like a month or two, it just like fizzled out. Yep. 
so I, I worked on like a new collection, but I decided to just give all that stuff away to the people that owned the the first collection, mm -hmm. like for free. So kind of like if you if you bought this, then you get this free. Like it's kind of like a reward, right? Um, and but I mean, you know, it's it's a lot of work. It took me like six months to make it, and then I think as time went by, plus you know the market was kind of dead. I I realized like this, it was awesome that one time, but like it's not very sustainable unless I'm like one of these big dogs like Parallel, and I have like a whole marketing team, right. like a biz dev team, and like I have all these connections, right? Or you're like that guy in uh, Exit Through the Gift Shop where you just have people making stuff for you and <laughs> it's yeah, coming yeah, out yeah. yeah it's yeah it's rare yeah um like just as an indie artist it's 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 hard so i i decided to kind of just treat it more as i mean what i originally treated as was the passion project i didn't i never expected to to blow up like that i yeah. just literally just made a bunch of robots and i was like if you like it support me if not that's totally yeah. cool just 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 like it on, on Twitter and I'll be happy. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, since that, I think I've made like zero dollars. So I was wow. like, right, I, I, I need to get a real job. Yeah. Uh, Cause that, that money's not gonna last forever. I love it, man. Well, dude, well that's a, what a wild ride. Thank you for sharing all that. That's, um, yeah. I mean, you were right in the belly of the beast. Uh, but luckily you got out, you, you survived it and, um, you know, hopefully didn't, didn't piss off, uh, any of your old clients or anything in the process. No, you know? no, no. I, I, yeah, I mean, I I was pretty transparent about everything. I yeah. was like, this is something I really like. I was like, I want to try this. And, you know, the team I worked with at Meta, they're like, they're all my friends now. And like, they still keep up with what I'm doing. We, yeah. we still talk. So that's awesome. It, it was it was cool. Well, let's get into your uh, your current day, uh, your, your day job. So you are now, I mean, I think it was pretty recent. I mean, like, so we're recording this November 9th. Um, and I think it was like sometime in October. You got hired as a creative director at Rive which is awesome. I just uh, interviewed Guido, the, uh, one of the co-founders, um, and I've been watching Rive very closely for the past two years. And this year, something happened. Like, it's, it's achieved escape velocity and everyone's talking about it. So I'm curious, like, first of all, how did you, like, find out about Rive and what was cool about it? Why did you decide to even, like, learn, you know, how to use it? I know you're dying to hear Jerry's answer, but before you do, I want you to know that the motion design classes we run at School of Motion are not like other online classes. They're insanely effective. And the results our students get are incredible. So incredible, in fact, that they say things like this. Before taking this class, I knew absolutely nothing about animation or After Effects. And so this class was able to take me from zero all the way to being able to animate my first pieces. After taking taking the course, you know all the basic knowledge and not only about how to use the software, you know the principle of how this software works, how they do this, and the logic how to do this. I took Cinema 4D Basecamp and it just really built my confidence. I'm now director of motion graphics at the design firm that I work for, and I can't say enough good things about it. Like, it is like the best investment ever. Curious? Check out our complete motion design curriculum at schoolofmotion.com. The link is in the description. All right, back to Jerry. Several years back, they were known as uh, NEMA, mm -hmm. which is more like a character animation tool. But not until recent, I think this year, my buddy Ross Plasco was using it a lot. It just kind of popped up on my radar and socials. And I, I, I thought it was cool because I've always been into like interactive stuff, but I've always had to rely on a dev to like yeah. make, make whatever I, I envisioned move. And then I think early summer, Guido tweeted something about like fooey, HUD, GUI stuff. I think they're about to release a text, the text feature or the textual feature. And then I DM'd him. I was like, "Oh, that's that's like my jam. Like, I'd love to do whatever you, you need done." Um, you know, I I was at a time where I was like still trying to figure out what I was going to do with my career. So I was out. Like, I'll, you know, I'll do it for free. Like, mm -hmm. I, I want to just be involved. So yeah, we just kept in touch. I started picking up the tool and playing with it, and uh, just went out from there. Oh, that's awesome. So, had you done anything like this? Like, you know, we're we're old enough where. Uh, we could have used Flash back when Flash was like a thing. And actually, I mean, I remember like my first freelance website, I don't think I ended up using it, but I built a Flash website because too advanced and all these cool, you know, studios making these crazy loaders and, you know, you click a button and all these lines, you know, fly out of it. 
I wanted to do that, and so Flash let you do that. And since then, there's basically been nothing <laughs> like that that makes it easy to do for designers. Had you been doing stuff like that, like at, in any way, like you know, in the past? I did a bunch of stuff like that at Meta, and I, I've worked with, with Lottie a lot. Yep. But nothing. None of those tools actually enable a designer to like design the interaction as well. Um, so like in Rive, it's, it's called the state machine. For me personally, that's the first time I've seen anything like that in like a designer tool um, that didn't require like code or anything like that. Um, so I thought that was like very empowering for somebody like myself that knows like zero code. And yeah, like if, I mean, if I worked with this tool called Keyframes at Meta, which is kind of like the Lottie equivalent for their internal team. Right, I've heard of it. Yeah, I don't know much about it. So yeah, I mean, if, if I had that, at the time, it probably would have saved me a lot of a lot of time and headache. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, like, what um, you know, because a lot of people listening to this haven't used Rive yet, and maybe even haven't done, uh, you know, that much with Lottie, and to where they they've run into the pain points that you've run into, right? So working at Meta, I'm assuming there were times where you were trying to create, okay, this is what it's doing, but then when the user clicks on it or taps it, this happens, but then this happens, and all that needs to happen fluidly, like. Maybe you could just talk about what the what the old painful process was for doing things like that and, and talk about how Rive sort of solves those problems. Yeah, so I think traditionally, I mean, at least the way I worked, I think I would have to like do a lot of prototyping and then put together like a whole PDF to pass off to the devs or the engineers to kind of explain like what happens when and how things should feel. Sometimes even like putting reference for like the, the animation curves and things oh, like that. Interesting. And wait, so can um, you maybe, is there like a specific example or something like it you could? Like like a project that I worked on? Yeah, even if it's just a little yeah. micro animation or something. Yeah, yeah. So like I worked on the Messenger brand um, redesign, which was, I mean, it, it's like a couple years old now. And the, also the Messenger Kids stuff. It's almost like these little animations that happen when you when you sign into the app and there's like, new features that come up, like, uh, I can't even think of any off the top of my head, but we, we'll call it Nux, like new user experience, okay. like these features that would come up. Um, and there's like these little micro animations that kind of represent what what the new thing is. Yep. Uh, we actually worked a lot with Toast, the animation studio, two brothers that run a, a 3D animation studio. Yeah, I'm looking them up right now. Oh, rad. Um, we also worked with, I think we worked with Stephen Keller a lot on that stuff. Oh, he's amazing, yeah. But anyways, yeah, like, I think a lot of it is like we had to have the engineers recreate a lot of that from scratch where I think Rive, you can kind of just take care of that on the designer side mm -hmm. and enable the, the engineers or the devs to kind of just focus more on their, the high impact work that they have to do. Got it. So like, you know, the, my, my limited experience animating stuff that, that needs Lottie, it's like, you know, the pain point I always ran into was just... After Effects is not designed, you know, from the ground up to create animations that are going to just play in real time. And so there's always this question of like, is what I'm creating even going to work? Like, or is it going to be too slow? Am I using features? Like, I remember trying to do something, you know, at the, I have this other company, Rolo, and I animated something in After Effects, and then I kicked out a Lottie file and played it, and the O didn't have a hole in the center of it anymore. Because, just because of like, oh, you have to do this trick to, you know, to make it work. But then when you're talking about with like interaction design, I click this button, I want a very specific thing to happen. I want really get in there with those animation curves and make it bounce just the right way, and it glows a little bit and all that kind of stuff. I don't even know, like, how would you... You use the word prototyping, where you basically just animating it the way it would be, and then you just have to tell someone else. So when it gets clicked, it does this. You figure out the code. Is that kind of how it worked? Yeah, they essentially have to recreate it. It's like I don't know if this is the right comparison, but like a designer passing off their boards to an animator. There's thing that things that are kind of like already established in the vision, but then you have to kind of like. There's a lot of back and forth that is eliminated um, when you can just like take care of that on the design end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's actually I think a good comparison because if you hand your boards off to an animator, they will make the animation look like your boards. But there's always little details that don't quite come through, and you know I'm sure like for some designers it's probably really annoying. <laughs> you know, like I ah, actually it wasn't that color; it was like you know a little bit different. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I've been playing with Rive. Uh, we, I've done one Rive tutorial. I plan on doing a lot more, um, and we definitely want to make a Rive class. 
and I'm pretty floored by the way they've built the state machine. Um, it's, it, you know, like you said, I mean, I, I can code a little bit, but you don't have to code at all. And I assume that at some point in Rise development, the ability to code will be even, uh, open up even more power. So like what kind of things can you do in Rive without coding? Like what does the state machine let you do? Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, I'm still, I'm still learning myself. Sure, yeah. But like you can do a lot. You can, you can make like mini games. I mean, obviously you can do almost anything you see in like product design, like everything from buttons to menus to like transitions. And you can, you know, the stuff that Duolingo does with the characters and stuff and all these different actions that kind of like execute depending on the user's input. I mean, basically, if you can think it up in a logic sense, it, I think it, it's, 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 you could do it. Yeah, it, it's hard for me to gauge because I'm still learning myself, but like there's, it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah. So, you know, when I started using it, obviously, like the first thing I did was figure out how the design tools work and the animation tools. That was very easy because if you know After Effects or basically any animation program, learning Rive is, is pretty trivial. Um, it's very well designed, so it's easy. And especially if you use Figma, um, which I use all the time. Figma and Rive work a lot alike. Um, the state machine is the one different thing, but I'm curious, like from your perspective, because I, I see... I see Rive as sort of like the the tip of the spear for this gigantic amount of work out there for motion designers, right? There's linear motion design, as is a term I keep hearing these days, which is what we've been doing up until this point. And then there's all the stuff that like happens inside of apps and interactions and all that stuff. And and that's what Rive is designed to do. What are the skills that motion designers may not have that they need to have to be really good at doing that stuff in Rive? I think just paying attention to how things, I mean, for lack of a better word, like interact with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, there's, there's a few aspects, like what makes an interaction satisfying, mm -hmm. which I think motion designers actually do have a sense of already. Like when you press a button, knowing to keep it responsive, like you don't want to like over animate right. and make it this like juicy 20 frame, like yeah. animation. Like it you flies just to, away, like, comes, yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. You just want it to like, boom, like, like sometimes even like, just a hold frame for like one frame. It's just like, boom. Getting a sense of like how that stuff works is definitely pretty key. And just understanding how logic works with this stuff. Logic, yeah. Like like I said, I'm not, I don't have a coding background, but like a lot of like conditions, like if this happens, then this happens. But if this also happens, maybe this also happens. And like if these three things happen, this happens. So just being very organized in your thinking and like how that stuff works. Yeah, I've seen I've seen examples now where someone, you know, it's almost like you click it once, something happens. You click it again, something different happens. Almost like there's like a counter in there somewhere adding one each time. But then when you get to the end, it loops back around. And so it is, I think it is pretty basic logic. You don't need to go, I mean, I, I don't even know. Do you need to like get into the concept of like loops and things like that? Like you would as a coder? What do you mean by loops? Like just something that loops? Versus something that plays once. Yeah, I mean, I guess actually now yeah. that I think about it, you really do need things to loop. Okay, so if you have, um, you know, I've seen like a, a lot of the stuff you've been posting. Actually, you posted something really interesting recently. It was like a, it was like a little rainbow kind of snake oh, yeah. thing, right? Um, so, it, so, and to me, that looks like, oh, wow, that seems pretty complicated. How do you do that? Like, maybe we can use that as a jumping off point. Um, and we'll bring it up on screen so everyone can see what, what we're talking about, too. And if you're listening to this, make sure you check the show notes. How, would, how does something like that work? And I know it's probably ridiculous trying to explain it <laughs> on a podcast, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to give the, the listeners like a sense of sort of what the capabilities are of this thing. Yeah, so that one in particular is actually quite simple. And I, I intentionally wanted it to be simple because I feel like just for myself, coming from a motion uh, design background, learning Rive, it's almost like the Andrew Kramer stuff back in the day. Like he'll show you something so simple but like you immediately recognize like the power mm -hmm. of that concept and you can apply so many things to it. Yeah. So basically the way that works is all it is, is so in Rive, it's called a nested artboard, but for AE folks, we just call it pre-comp. It's a pre-comp with a, like a looping color. It's like a square that has like a looping, like color spectrum, like a yeah. hue. It's just filled with a color that changes and loops. Yeah, right. yeah, that's it. It just goes from whatever. And then you bring it into a main artboard or for A folks, the, the main comp, and you just tile it. 
however many times. I did like 10 by 10. Yep. You could do like 1,000 by 1,000, whatever. And then you assign a state machine to where, where the cursor hovers over one of those pre-comps or nested artboards. It plays. So essentially, if you go like this, it'll play like in a row. And that's, that's it. That's all it is. That's crazy. But when I first wrapped my head around the concept of opera, I was like, oh, you could do like, you can make like an entire drawing game out of this. You could do like, what inspired me was like, remember Lightbright? Yeah, when of we course. Kids? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lightbright. Yeah. But like, and you can, you can assign it to like, only work on click. You can, you can make it change colors. Depends on how many times you click it. You can, you know, if you, if you hover somewhere, like the, the surrounding ones activate. Um, there's a lot of cool things you can do with it. So that's like the very basic, basic concept. And I thought that folks from the motion uh, community would, would recognize like how powerful that, that simple concept is. Yeah, I, so I saw a demo. Um, I, I can't remember the person who posted it, but um, there's a newer feature, at least as of this recording, it's pretty new, where you could animate, say like a map opening or something, and then you embed that in your website. But at runtime, what that what is on that map changes and you can load a JPEG on there. You can, you know, you can change type and, and all these things that are on it. And have you started playing around with that stuff? Because to me, that's when, when I saw that, I was like, okay, now you're, you're getting into a world where every single person who makes Webflow websites or Framer websites is going to want to know how to use this. And that's to me, uh, you know, the technology and using Rive is a really cool app. For the most exciting thing for me, like sort of looking at it with a bird's eye view is this opens up motion design to the 10 or 100x bigger world of product in a way that I felt like was kind of, there was a little bit of a gatekeeper in front of it because there was, you had to have a developer to do a lot of these things. And now you don't. So to me, Rive seems like this huge deal. So anyway, using that, um, you know, that feature as an example uh, like, have you played around with that? And are there other things like that where you see it and you're like, oh my God, like this, this could be on every website on the internet in 10 years. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's quite a few features that are about to come out like that. I haven't played with them as much myself, but a lot of the team has, and I've, I've seen some really crazy stuff. I don't think it necessarily cuts out the need for a developer, but it, it bridges the gap between like designers and developers where like, they're kind of like talking to each other a lot more closely now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I think the developers can, can focus on more like the high impact stuff that they need to do that designers definitely can't do. Yeah. I mean, I keep coming back to this, like, it just bridges that gap. It, the gap was pretty big and, and now it's like getting closer and it's cool. Cause like a lot of designers can kind of see their vision come to fruition, like real time, like, like as they make it. And then, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> where else to go from there? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things about it. You know, um, the the episode with Guido and everyone, you can go watch that one too. Um, you know, he he gets into a lot of the sort of less, like from a motion designer's perspective, less sexy features, like the renderer itself, which is this like new way of rendering uh, vectors, you know, and it's like stupid fast. And so even if you're used to using After Effects and then using Lottie to translate, you have to be a lot more careful with Lottie files. Um, and, you know, there's like this ecosystem around Lottie files to like compress them and make them more efficient because the renderer is not nearly as fast as Rives. And so you'll end up uh, just being able to do more complex stuff too, which is really cool. I, I wanted to ask you this too, because, and I asked Guido about it. It was really kind of interesting to me. Some of the larger companies that make animation software, they're very, very developer heavy. They don't really have like artists on staff sort of in leadership roles, pushing the product forward, um, at least some of the big ones that I've come into contact with. But Rive has a lot of animators, it seems like, you know? Um, it seems like it's almost, it's probably like almost half and half, like artists working with the tool. And also, you know, that's a marketing thing too. So I'm curious, like, what's the environment like at Rive? Like, how does it feel, you know, you've worked at Meta, which is tech, like, sort of a software company. Rive is a software company. And you've also worked at, you know, you freelanced for creative shops, brand new school and places like that. How does it feel like as a company, you know, what's like the, the culture like there? I, so I've, I've been here maybe a month now and I, I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. I mean, for me, it scratches, a, I mean, it scratches a lot of itches, checks a lot of boxes uh, just because I'm, I'm into gaming and, you know, now I get to design stuff for gaming. 
but it's cool. It's so we do a lot of folks call it dog fooding is called dog fooding a lot yeah. where like, you know, like you said, the artists are using the tool. It's almost like game testers testing a game just to stress test as much as possible and, and see what works and, and, and even like request certain features from like a, an artist POV. And I think that's, that's super smart. Honestly, I, since I've been there, I haven't been able to do that as much just cause I've been more like on the creative director side. Um, and just like, just tons of things to do. Yeah. But I, I cannot wait until like where I can just dive in and play with the new features. There's like a there's a there's a good amount of new features coming out. And that's another thing. They they update so often and like it's almost like every other day, like the the engineers are like, Yeah, we, we got this new feature, like try it out in the test in the beta testing uh version of the app. I was like, Oh man, I was like, I wish I had time to do all this stuff. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. It's it's very refreshing too. Well, dude. So this will be this will be my last question for you. Um, you know, so you're you're very new at the company, but you've been using Rive for a while, and it sounds like, um, you know, a lot of the things that you sort of mentioned, like you 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 know, you love that sort of video game aesthetics. You love video games. You're now Rive is really making a big push. I can tell into um, working with game engines because there's kind of this like vacuum. There's this hole in that market for 2D tools to make interfaces for the games. Uh, Guido is explaining that um, Rive is kind of like uniquely suited to, to sort of help there. I'm curious from your perspective though, so you're a motion designer, you know, who's had this like this career and you've done the NFT thing and now you're working at a software company. What's the most exciting thing for you? Like looking forward, you know, like Rive is still, I mean, it's not that new of a tool. It's been around for a few years now, but it's getting really adopted now. And I think in the next decade, it's gonna blow up. It's gonna be huge. Um, I'm pretty convinced <laughs> at this point. So I'm curious, like you're on the inside of that. What's the most exciting thing to you in terms of opportunities that you see for motion designers, new capabilities, new kinds of projects people will be able to work on? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I'm just into games. So like I'm excited about just making anything for games. And I think there's a lot of folks like myself in the motion design world who grew up on games and always thought it would be fun to like, how fun would it be to make the design, like the start screen or a continue screen for a video game. Mm. So I think opportunities for folks to do that are going to open up. With Rives, it's, this is going to come out probably before this even airs, but they're about to have native support in Unity. So that's going to be huge, I think. At least from my conversations with my indie game dev friends, they hate you know, design and anime and UI, but folks in the motion design community, they love that stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's going to open a whole door for like a lot of job opportunities for that kind of thing. There's, there's some pretty notable brands that are adopting on the product side and the gaming side, which is cool. So I think just naturally, this is going to open up a lot more demand for, um, folks that know how to use the tool. And yeah, I think it's just going to create a whole new economy of, of, of motion design. I want to thank Jerry for being so open to talk about everything, especially the wild world of NFTs that he was a part of. Motion design is filled with super talented and interesting people like Jerry, and I hope these interviews get you inspired to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. And if they do, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel or to the podcast platform of your choice so you don't miss any of the amazing guests that we have coming up. And that is it for this one. I'll see you next time.